It's good to be back with you this weekend. Yeah, we're celebrating freedom. Uh, I, I think we look forward to the 4th of July. I know I have since I've been a little boy. I, you know, I loved to go hear the fireworks. I hated those big booms, but I loved the fireworks. And, but freedom brings... Um, many different thoughts to mind. I was sitting down to, to write this message and I, and I realized when I thought of freedom, I, my first thoughts of freedom was when I was really um, little, not terrible, I guess I shouldn't say terrible little, probably 12, 11, 12 years old. I had, uh, I, I, w- when we rode bikes and you know, back in those days, mom kicked us out of the house. She said, you're done, get out of the house. Breakfast is over, I don't wanna see you until lunchtime and then after lunch was over, she said, you're out of the house till supper time. But it, when I wanted to go ride bikes with my friends, I always had to find a bike and borrow it because I, I had had one given to me, oh, several years before that. Uh, but it was old, it was now stuck in the attic of the garage and I wanted a new bike and so I asked my dad if if uh, I, I had this I remember this presentation I had all laid out why I should have a new bike and uh, I'd seen this bright shiny red one at Montgomery Wards if some of you remember that uh, and, and 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 I wanted it and and so I went to my dad and I said you know could I could I get this bike and and I said would you loan me the money I didn't have the guts to ask him to give me the money I don't know if he would have or wouldn't have but he thought about it a little bit and he says yes I'll loan you the money thirty five dollars and like 60 some cents I remember it well because I had to pay it back and back in those days this tells you how old I am you know you, you, you worked for a dime or you worked for a quarter or you worked for a dollar and and so I discovered that freedom had a cost that was the first thing I learned about the freedom to have my own bike that I didn't have to borrow and it was mine it was all mine now I I I rode this bike and I loved this bike and 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 to me it was just as free as a bird running down the road. Remember, some of you I've told you my story. I stuttered terribly bad, and so I could get on my bike all by myself. I didn't have to talk and I could just ride as free as could be. Now, I, I remembered though it, it it was a single speed and and so you can only get it to go so fast as fast as my legs would run. But I remembered that up in the attic of the garage was this old English racer that I had. Been been given uh, years before and I went up in the garage and sure enough the drive sprocket on it was probably two maybe three inches bigger in diameter but when I got to looking at it it fit and so I took my bike apart I put this great big sprocket on it now it took you a little bit more to get it going but once you got it going it flew well, I decided to take it out for a maiden uh, voyage run because we lived on Route 619 south of Akron, Ohio, and we lived on a big hill. And, uh, and, and so you'd come down the hill and, and the driveway came in and, and actually my dad pastored there. So, so we had the church building. Then there was the gravel driveway that went back into the parking lot and the house was on the other side of the gravel lot. And, uh, and, so, and so my brother and I, I, I know we had many cars that weren't happy with us, but, but there was a side street that came out in the middle of this hill, and my brother and I would, uh, we would wait till there was a break in the traffic, and then we'd fly off of that side street, pedaling as fast as we could go, and cars would hit the brakes, and whatever, but we'd come flying down the hill, we'd, we'd head into the, drive, the gravel driveway, but we were going fast enough that you couldn't, you couldn't turn into the driveway way you had to go up into the yard and you would swing way up into the yard and then come back down between the house and the church. So anyways, I decided to do this at night and or afternoon. It was evening because my mother was having some kind of meeting with the women of the church in the backyard. I come flying down the hill and I could tell this was a lot faster. I come flying into the yard and I discovered the freedom of speed and I couldn't make it back between the house and the church, and I hit the picture window, and there was a a big flower box going full blast. Boom! My mother heard the noise. She come around. She said I was laying there on the ground. She wanted to know if I was okay. I said I was. I learned that freedom has to be used wisely. It's an important thought, but, but uh, all freedom does. We celebrate, in the country we live in, we celebrate freedom. 
And it came at a terrible cost. It came at a high price. It came at the cost of many, many lives. And, and now it's our responsibility to use our freedom wisely. But greater still, Jesus said in John 8, 36, So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. So I hope this weekend that we can really celebrate this greater freedom, not just here at Crossbridge, but as we gather across our nation and, 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 and as Christians in, in many churches, tribes, denominations, all of that, that, that we really will take the time to reflect and celebrate the freedom that we have in God. As Pastor Sherry said, it's my last weekend with you here at Crossbridge. And, and I want to say first thank you for inviting me. Ellen <clears throat> and I have considered it an, up, an utmost privilege to worship with you uh, over these past few months. It's been quite a few months. And uh, my reason for being here probably isn't as striking as Pastor John. I, I love the story he told and the connection. And I was reminded of the faithfulness of God when we take a step of faith. He always reveals himself to us in powerful ways. And if you don't think you are at a blessed church after hearing Pastor John's story, I want you to know that you truly are. I'm simply here because a good friend, Pastor Sherry, asked me if I would. Now, if you haven't liked my preaching, please don't hold it against her. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, but I'm also here as your district administrator. And, and uh, we, we do make ourselves available to our churches whenever we can. We're happy to serve. We're happy to fill in. And uh, we do that anytime that we can. Next week, Pastor Keith will be here. Boy... And uh, I, I'm sure, I'm sure, in fact, I know that you're glad this interim time has come to a close and, and, you're, and, and maybe even more excited for next week and, and, and for the future of your, of your church. And I want to extend from the district, on behalf of our district superintendent, I want to extend to you a special thank you. Um, first, you know, for continuing to faithfully gather, continuing to do life together, continuing to be a community of believers that, that, and supporting the mission of what you're accomplishing in your community. It's so easy to give here. I love Pastor Sherry's sermon last week. And, and, I, and I love the fact that, that as, as you have the opportunity to give, you give so wonderfully and beautifully. A special great big thank you also to the staff. Thank you. Uh, our district superintendent, again, we both thank you for the work that you've done. It's not been easy. You've added to your jobs. You've added to what your normal everyday activity is, and now you've had to add extra responsibility during this time. And then Crossbridge, we say thank you to you because we believe, and I believe, that you are an absolute true picture of Christ in your community. You have done an unbelievable job as a church. Pastor Keith is not going to be like your last pastor. So don't judge him based on Pastor Kevin. Rather, look at his giftedness and, and how God has brought him here for such a time as this. Give him grace, give him space, give him time to know you, to acclimate uh, to the community here in, in Ottawa and Peru and, 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 and allowing him to do that so that he will bear and you will bear much fruit as you grow together and God brings you together. Give him the freedom to lead you in serving this great area that you live in. Give yourself the freedom if you need to, to let go of the past and embrace this next chapter of Crossbridge. We understand that it, it's a time of change. Open your hearts and your minds to what God will have him to teach you and to encourage you. And we pray that your vote that brought him here will morph into a mighty act of God in, in transforming your community. That's our prayer. It reminds me of your prayer you have been praying. And, and, and I would continue, I would encourage you to continue to pray daily 
at 207. You've been praying, Psalms 20, verse 7, some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Now, Pastor Keith won't let you boast in him, but rather his delight will be to equip you and, and to encourage you to boast mightily in the name of the Lord our God. As I was reading that, Psalms 20, my prayer for you is verses 4 and 5 of that same chapter. May he grant your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. He certainly has been, and I believe as you are faithful, he'll continue to do so and much more. So, greetings from the district, encouragement from the district, thank you from the district. So now what does the Lord want me to share uh, with you one last time? First and foremost, Ellen and I have come to love you. Even though we realize we don't know a lot of you by name. But I've learned over the years as you stand before a congregation, time and time again you give your life away. And you bear your life and you share how the power of God transforms it. And I realize there's many times I leave the platform and Satan taunts me with, you're an idiot for sharing that sinful past. Now people will think less of you. And I've had to make a note to myself, what Satan gets you to do, he will then do everything he can to keep from you from bringing it to light. But if my sharing makes you think less of me and more of the power of God, I'll give you my whole life. You can have it gladly. When I had my accident with my youngest son and he lost his life in that accident, I learned a very valuable lesson. And that's what I, that's what I feel called to preach, that God wants this personal, intimate relationship with you. It's not based on just what people teach you. And from that intimate relationship, you become totally free, confident, excited uh, to tell others about that relationship and inviting them to experience that. That's the passion that puts me in front of you speaking to you. Every time I preach and teach, I want you to know that God wants this personal, intimate relationship with you that's not only just spiritual, but it's physical, it's relational, it's social, it's emotional, it's all of that wrapped in one. And, I, and I'll do my best to illustrate that in any way possible that I can. But I've also learned that when the illustration makes more of an impact than the point we're trying to make... I've not communicated correctly. So during my time here, if I've ever done something and all you remember is the illustration, forgive me. Because, because I want you to know what God does as a result of that. Now I have and always been and I hope to continue to be an avid reader. I remember as a very young boy going to the, going to the library, we could go every two weeks and, and, and we were allowed to check out seven books. I remember that. And so we would, my sister would drive us there on Friday evening after my dad, dad got home from work. We only had one car. Um, and, and, and so we'd go and we'd check out seven books and, and we would come home and, and my brother and I would read till we literally fell asleep and we'd start start Friday night and we'd be done by Sunday afternoon, then had to wait two weeks to go back to get seven more books. I, I remember that. I love to read. Uh, I enter, when I entered the corporate world, I love to read research. And, and, and I've looked back over my 21 years now, a short time actually in full-time ministry. I've read books, Prepare for Ministry. I've read books that, that uh, continue to grow my life. And, and, and I've read many books about ministry and deepening my personal relationship with Christ. And, and, and I learned something very early. You can't lead someone where you aren't. It's an important thing. So, so we, we, my, my desire is to know God so intimately and so well that anytime I speak, you'll know God. And you'll discover him in a normal human way. It's not something that's just mystical that I can't obtain. But it's something that God gives to me and gives to you. The Bible will always be my main source book. There are three others that stand out. 
uh, that, that I think have had a major impact on my life. I loved Hero Maker by Dave Ferguson, which was really the five essential practices for leaders, multiplying leaders. So working with people in the church to get them to take that next step of faith in their life. The now discipleship pathway and the three, co- and the three colors of community by Christian Schwartz probably had the greatest impact on me personally, Jim Book, inside me that maybe doesn't come out, but has definitely helped me know my life in Christ. Home Run by Kevin Myers and John Maxwell, learning God's game plan for life and leadership. When Pastor Lauren read a scripture, it reminded me of this, of this book, Home Run, and actually I thought, that's my last thoughts I want to share. And, and, uh, and, and, and she referenced that greatest commandment that Moses had given to the people back in Deuteronomy and Exodus, and, but Jesus affirms it in Matthew 22 when he was meeting with people in the church. And one of them was an expert of the law and tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commitments. The writer of the book Home Run, he also throws in another verse that, that is powerful in that book. And, and it, it's a great verse that I, that I, that I want to live. And, it, and he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God, because all He has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't coffee. The, the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know how God's will for you, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I like these two scriptures, they will, to be my final signature, my final benediction uh, to you as, as, we, as we leave and, you're, and, and you start into your, the next chapter of Crossbridge. And, 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 and they're illustrated in this book in Home Run and is written actually by a Wesleyan pastor who compares life to the game of baseball. It's a great book. I encourage you to find, you read it and get it on Kindle. Uh, he poses a question though, and I want to ask you this question tonight. How would you best describe your life today? Would you say it's empty? Would you say it's unfulfilled? Would you say it's frustrated? Or would you say it's full? What, how would you describe your life? I'd like you to think about that for a couple minutes as I talk. So in this game of baseball, there are very, very few rules. There's always four bases. You score only when you cross home plate. You must touch first, second, and third bases before crossing home plate. You must run the bases in order. And if you miss a base, you're out. We're used to rules. There's rules to every game we play. But this game never changes. The rules are the same. For life and living, Jesus said everything we do hinges on three rules. One, love God first. Two, love yourself. And three, love others. This is the full life. If you say my life is empty, my life is unfulfilled, my life is frustrated, until we learn to live the three rules that God gave us, we're going to be one of those first three. In sports, think about this in sports, maybe in life. We start by getting good enough to be on a team. We practice, practice, practice. And then we learn to play with others when we get on a team. And, and then we learn to be a better player with the coach helping us to be a better player. We see that in life. We find ourselves practicing for hours to master a talent, a skill, a quest to be conquered. And, and, I, and it took me three years to get Ellen. You know, you had to keep practicing and practicing and practicing. And finally she said yes. Then we join a team, a group. We enter a relationship to test that skill with or against others. And then we learn how to be a team player. (laughs) In some cases, we have to go to counseling. We see this in life so many, many ways. 
you know, whether it's sports, jobs, musicians, education, marriages, we're good at living backwards. Because Paul said there, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So Jesus said, first love, the, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So first, we need to get a coach. If I want to make life work, I need a coach. And it's God. It, it, it's God is all that I need. This personal relationship with God is what gives me the purpose and the power for living. That's where we start. That's where we need to start if I want the full life. Then Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So second, we have to love yourselves. Other, we were taught as kids, Jesus, others, and you. But we need to remember this, that I have to love yourself. Because we have to discover ourselves. And if I don't know how to love myself, if I don't know who I am in, then I can't wholesomely see other people. I can't see other people as God would have me see them. So I need that relationship with God and then I need to know and discover who I am and to love myself completely so that I have the ability to be truly set free, to live that full life. And then third, if I get those first two right, if we get that right, then we can really love others Regardless of whether they reciprocate that love, regardless of whether they respond, we love them and we love them the, the, for the way they are and who they are and, and, and we're able to accept them even when they reject us. Our Nazarene denominational core values challenge us to live this way. We're first called to be Christian. We enter our own personal relationship with God. And then holiness, which is a word we go, what does that mean? But it, it means we allow God to change us, to transform us, to coach us so that we can connect with others. And then the result of those first two is missional to make an impact, a difference in your community. And I say time and time again, that's Crossbridge. Hey, you know what? It was another major reason for me to say yes. Adding 20 to 24 hours a week, 25 hours a week to my schedule on top of my schedule so that I can come and speak to you because I want to speak into the lives of people where God is making a difference. You are Christian. You are holiness and you are missional. You need to celebrate that freedom in Christ. But our culture fi I, fights this ideal life. It, it teaches, first of all, it's about independence. You know, the world revolves around me. And second, I'll work with others if I have to, as long as it suits me and benefits me. And third, if I have to or if I'm forced to, I'll, help, I'll ask for help to get along with others. So it leads us back to this, how do you describe your life today? The empty life. The empty life is our purpose with our power. So I only love myself, I only care about myself and, 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 and what I want. And the truth of the matter is I find that gets lonely and I find that there's no sense and there's no real purpose in my life. And, 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 and so I'm constantly wondering more and I'm wanting to get more things because that's the way I fill my life by thinking if I get more, I will have a purpose. Or is our life unfulfilled, which is our purpose with God's power, God has gifted me, but I'm only using it for my good. His way, but my will be done. I love the story of Samson. I don't have the time, but take you into the Old Testament and story of Samson. We hear of Samson, the big, strong guy. You know what? He was, he was gifted by God, but he wanted everything for his purpose and ultimately cost him his life, the unfulfilled life that ends the frustrated life, God's purpose with our power. You know, I'm following God. I, I want to do what He wants to do, but I just can't get it all done. I find myself exhausted. I find myself not being able to keep up. I'm wondering, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do everything. It's God's will, but I'm trying to do it my way. I'm reminded of King Saul in the Old Testament. Yes, he had, his God had, he was anointed to be king, and he was, a, but 
He wanted to do it his way. Starts real early. He wouldn't even wait as, as, as the prophet Samuel told him he needed to wait, but he didn't wait. He just decided to do things on his own, and ultimately it cost King Saul his life as well. The full life. God's purpose with his power. Today is God's day for my life. His plan. If he puts me there, he gives me the strength to do it. That's the beauty of the full life. Is that surrendering to God to say what happens to me today is what, is, 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 is what God wants me to do. And, 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 and as I step into that, as I embrace that, whether it's, whether it's a positive, whether it's a challenge. You remember I said, I said problems are not problems, they're opportunities. And, 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 and so where is God in that? Because he allows me to go in that. If I believe that I have surrendered my life completely to God, when we believe that, then we go into it with our eyes wide open saying, Lord, this is your day. Bless me in it. Nah, give me a problem or two because I want to see you in my life. Don't be afraid to ask, pray for problems. You know, I don't know whether you do that. Whether you woke up this morning and said, Lord, I just need some problems today. You know, I need some challenges in my life so that I can see you working. And, 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 and oftentimes Ellen and I will sit down and say, boy, I had a really now moment today. We call them now moments. And we'll, and we'll share about what God has, has done in our lives and, and, and the challenge that it was and, and, and how we saw God in that. No, no miracles. I'm not miracle. There's no flash bang. But we saw God and we saw his presence and we saw his strength and, and we saw how he helped us. Take another day and to live today knowing that when, when we go to bed at night and lay your head on your pillow, you can say, thank you, Lord, for my full life. Thank you for everything that took place in my life. I think of Daniel in the Bible. And, it, and if you read the story of Daniel in the lion's den, we heard the story. We know Daniel's a young man. What did he do? Daniel believed that God had him. So no matter what he faced, he surrendered to that without fighting and gave his life to God. And what happens? His life is fulfilled and his life, he went through several kings and, and he continued to live and he continued to serve and that's what God wants to do with us today. The full life allows us to be free, truly free indeed. This full life is discovering God, a living, breathing, full dependence on Him. That's what my prayer is for you. Yet the last thing I can say to you is that the Word of God is alive and that He wants for you to celebrate a full life that allows you to live with His purpose and His power. From that comes this passion to love others. And regardless of how they treat me, regardless of what they say, it allows us that they can be drawn to us so that we can share with them that full life that God offers to us. The full life compels us to sh share Jesus with others. You see somebody hurting, you think, man, there's a, there's a solution for that hurt. There's a solution for that no hope. There's a solution for that emptiness, that frustration, that unfulfilled, like there's something missing in your life. We have the answer. It's in us and it lives in us. That is true freedom. Whatever we celebrate this weekend, we can celebrate the freedom in Christ. Oh, yes, we'll continue to grow. We'll continue to be more free. But there is no greater freedom to celebrate than the freedom in Christ. Will you pray with me? Gracious Father, thank you for the freedom that you have to set us free. We sing about you being our Savior we sing about you being our God. But Lord, it's more than just a song we sing. It's a life we have in you that lifts us from those at that miry mess that our life seems to be in and sets us free to live a life that's full, that's transformational, that changes us from the inside out, that gives us a reason to, to, to love people regardless of the condition we find them in or who they are. Lord, I thank you for Crossbridge. 
I pray that your power continues to rest on them. I pray that you, God, whom we celebrate with all of our lives this weekend, that you touch each life here in a powerful way from that youngest child to that oldest adult. Lord God, might you reveal yourself to them. In your name we pray. Amen.